Welcome to this edition of Association Chat, which is your weekly online discussion for the association community where we warm ourselves by the virtual fire with the topics of the day, welcoming thought leaders and trailblazers alike to join up in this online home for the community. I'm your host, Kiki Latalian, CEO of Amplified Growth Digital Marketing and host of this weekly chat that's been around in some form or fashion since 2009 on Twitter, Blab, Huzzah, and now Crowdcast. So here we are, everyone. It's exciting. I know you're excited for this, for this episode. No matter where you live, you, you couldn't have missed the presidential election we just went through or the impact that it's had on, on everything from our Facebook discussions to talk around the Thanksgiving tables. And no matter which administration is in office, we all have to find ways to work together. What that work looks like, how we conduct it, and all the related nuances can be extremely challenging for any association leader. But what about when you're the leader of the association of associations and your choice isn't as simple as switching the subject to sports or the Kardashians? So, for the, <laughs> and John, don't try it because I won't let you. <laughs> for this association chat, we're going to find out how the leaders of the American Society of Association Executives are anticipating and handling these challenges following a divisive U.S. presidential election. What are the challenges? What are they hearing from members and how are they communicating and what do they see as they lead ASAE into a more complex future that likely includes increasing concerns regarding diversity and inclusion and many other issues too. So with me today are John Graham, the President and Chief Executive Officer of ASAE, and Scott Wiley, ASAE Board Chair and Executive Director for the Ohio Society of CPAs. Welcome both of you to association chat. Thanks, Kiki. It's great to be with you today. Thank it's you, great. Kiki. It's so great to have you here. And you know, for anyone who is getting a little distracted by the chat on the side, this is both a pro and a con to doing these live streaming events. So if it bothers you too much, you can ignore it. If you want to participate participate in the discussion, you can participate that way. But I want to jump into this and I want to talk about um, while I think most people understand the appropriate need to establish a healthy working relationship with the new U.S. presidential administration, I think that the tenor and tone of the president-elect has caused some concern, to say the least, among many in the association community. And so many, communi many of the, the members of our community have raised issues with last week's National Association of Manufacturers letter, which some have interpreted as support for a person whose past personal and political statements have ranged from lewd to insulting, and in some cases even threatening to several segments of society in both the U.S. and abroad. And so we, we now know that the NAM letter was crafted before the election was decided but some members question why it wasn't further reviewed given the potential for controversy. So John, I'm going to direct this first question to you. I'm, so, I'm sure you're so excited. <laughs> Please explain the, the thought process behind the initial effort to craft this letter and decide, you know, discuss maybe why it was not further reviewed before its final issue. Is it a normal process for each election? Can you, can you tell us a little bit more about it? Well, I think the uh, the NAM letter itself, when NAM reached out to us, uh, as well as many others, uh, at the end of October, uh, it was a letter that was uh, not addressed to anybody, and uh, with the clear understanding that it would have gone to a president-elect Clinton or a president-elect Trump. Mm -hmm. uh, quite honestly, at the time, uh, we were fairly confident that it was going to be a president-elect Clinton, uh, but we would have signed on to it anyway. Uh, the letter was very generic. Uh, the letter really indicated that we do what associations, that we would do what associations do best, which is bring people together to form consensus, uh, to solve problems, and to bring forward solutions uh, with a diverse group of people. And so mm -hmm. that was really the intent of the letter. And uh, the letter 
uh, that uh, went out after the election, uh, we felt uh, we would be working with the Trump, at that time we knew we'd be working with the Trump administration. Uh, the letter had already been signed because we signed it uh, with a neutral uh, addressee, if you will. And so uh, we, we felt that uh, it, like we have with other elections uh, and like we will when a new uh, President Trump takes office, uh, we want to work with the administration like we work with the Obama administration, the Bush administration, the Clinton administration, and on, on and on. So uh, we wanted to work with, a, uh, with the Trump administration to make sure that association issues are front and center uh, on the agenda. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that um, since uh, the letter came out and a lot of people responded, um, myself included, that was that was definitely something that caught my attention. And and I looked at it and I thought, what is this? Um, you know, have if you had it to do over again, would it be the same? Would you approach it the same way? I'm sure that the flavor of this particular election um, you know, definitely is a little different than what we've experienced in the past. Well, well, with my conversations with Nam, I think it's important to recognize that uh, putting a letter together before an election is something new. So actually, mm -hmm. from that vantage point, we hadn't participated in anything like that previously. Mm -hmm. And the reason that Nam was interested in putting the letter together, which I think was a great idea, is that the election at that point uh, was very divisive, uh, was very polarizing. And we really felt that associations were in a great place to bring together a very divided country, uh, regardless of whether you were a Clinton supporter or a Trump supporter or you couldn't support either one. Uh, we were very much a divided and polarized country. And uh, we felt and still continue to feel uh, that associations have a place in bringing people together, uh, not driving a stake between them. And we feel mm -hmm. that that letter was a good faith effort to let whichever administration won know that, uh, you know, associations stand ready, uh, ASE as well as many others, stand ready to help the new administration uh, bring the country back together again. Mm -hmm. I think that, um, you know, one thing that uh, has definitely become clear and the conversation that I've seen on Collaborate, which is for anyone who's not familiar with it, it's ASE's private member community. And um, from some of the conversation that I've had separately, uh, people, a lot of people appreciate the fact that that ASAE is, you know, willing to work with whatever office, no matter no matter who's in in the office of president, they want to make sure that that they're doing the best that they can for all of us. But some people are concerned that because of the direction that things have taken, that um, it could change the way that the, the community served. So, uh, John, which, which business policy issues does ASAE view as crucial to its efforts to serve the community? And how will it prioritize its engagement with the incoming administration? Well, I think uh, as we know, regardless of who won the election, uh, tax policy was going to be front and center and tax policy apparently is going to be front and center based on some of the conversations and news that we've heard since the election. Uh, so what that means is that uh, ASAE has to be extraordinarily vigilant in making sure that associations are not adversely impacted by whatever tax policies get put into place. Uh, in some of the Republican drafted documents uh, and tax proposals uh, during put forward during the Obama administration, uh, we have noticed that uh, things like sponsorship income, uh, affinity program income, uh, royalty income, uh, investment income, potentially trade show income, all these areas are subjects uh, that are being discussed and could very well result in uh, associations being very adversely affected uh, by a tax policy uh, that is going to be different than the one we have now. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't know how different it's going to be until something's put forward. Uh, so we uh, have to work with the administration. And uh, and I think that uh, particularly the administration and particularly uh, Ways and Means and Senate Finance 
uh, to be sure that whatever tax policies are put, for, put forward do not adversely impact associations. And I might add, the broader nonprofit community, when you think of things like the tax deduction for charitable contributions, uh, which is a huge issue for many uh, associations. I think the other issue going forward for many associations and the broader nonprofit community uh, is the whole issue of government funding for social programs. And that's another area where I think uh, we're going to have to be vigilant and we will play a role uh, in working with other others in the space to be sure that uh, uh, associations in the broader nonprofit charitable community are not negatively impacted. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, John, beautifully, beautifully answered. However, I feel Scott is getting lonely. So, Scott. <laughs> I don't I don't want you to feel ignored. How how does ASAE maintain a non a nonpartisan stance? Um, and especially when you are looking at serving, you know, politically minded associations uh, with potentially competing political agendas, you know. This is a delicate balance that that you have to that you have to face. So, how do you do it? You know, Kiki, I think that's a great question. I think it is a delicate balance. And for us, it all comes back to telling the story that is the power of A. For those that aren't familiar with that, that's the power of associations, which is the hallmark of ASAE's advocacy initiative that really represents our community, whether that's a professional society, a trade association, or other organizations that are out there doing good work on behalf of people, whether those are people in a profession or whether those are people who work in an industry. I think the important things to rep that, recognize, that we recognize are clear are this. We represent a broad, broad-based membership from all over our country, but increasingly all over the world. And if we have more than one member, which we clearly do, we're likely going to have disagreement amongst our members. We recognize that and applaud that because we think that adds to the diversity of our community. And certainly that's something that I think we have recognized over the last several weeks, certainly as the election has approached and since then. I think two things to be that we should be mindful of. When ASAE thinks about advocacy and how we approach it to make sure we're not only representing the community, but also to advocate on behalf of associations. And it's important to recognize we're a vital sector. We think about how is this going to impact associations and how is it going to impact association professionals? As you might imagine, there are a number of issues, policies, laws, et cetera, that affect some of our members, but those do not affect associations as a whole. And mm -hmm. even though some of us personally may wish to weigh in on those, and there may be calls from some of our members to weigh in, that's not our domain. What we think about is, what is this going to do to the community who are a part of our community, and how does it affect all associations? So a great example that I think we have to be mindful of is, we clearly, have a new administration who will take uh, authority of the executive branch on January 20th. We have a new Congress, many new members of Congress on both sides of the House. It is incumbent and absolutely essential that ASAE be out there advocating and telling the, power, the story that is the power of A. We have an incredible responsibility, and I view it just as that, and I think I speak for our entire board. ASAE has a responsibility that we cannot shirk to make sure that public policymakers and those other key influencers who will serve in positions of leadership in the Trump administrations not only know who we are, what we stand for, and the good that we do, but they also have to know why it is we stand for those things, why those are cardinal virtues of our community, why we've adopted those policies, who we care about, and why it is that we're advocating. Simply doing nothing is not an option. Now, in doing something, though, we often will recognize that not every member of our community fully supports that. We re recognize that and respect that. But at the end of the day, our public policy committee, in concert with our management team, and certainly with the full support of our board, and our public policy committee represents more than 50 association professionals from all over the country, state associations, national associations, global associations, inside the Beltway perspective, outside the Beltway perspective, male, female, young, old, the whole gamut. And when they look at those public policies, they're looking at 
What are we doing to make sure that associations have a tax environment that can help them be successful? What are we doing to protect the charitable deduction? What are we doing to make sure we're talking about the critical issues related to health care that are impacting so many of our associations, particularly those who are small staff associations? You know, that's where I got my start. So I think as we look at that, Kiki, we take a whole world view. We know fully that we've got folks on different sides of the aisle, different sides of the perspective. We make sure we're not only asking our public policy committee, but throughout the year we survey our people. We ask them what are their top challenges. We do that in advance of our annual fly-in day. We bring hundreds of professionals in for that to make sure they're talking with their legislators and their staffs about the issues that matter and putting a local face on those issues. I think we do a great job of that. I think there's an opportunity, though, for us to take the broader series of contexts around the current election to make sure we're considering that and how that will form our perspective going forward. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, so there's a lot, there's a lot there to unpack. And I think that, um, you know, I, I think it's encouraging to hear that, especially from, you know, your perspective and your experience in the past, having experience with a small staff and, a lot of people are concerned not just about the diversity and inclusion issues that sort of um, prompted this discussion, but also about, you know, what about, you know, the little associations that aren't, aren't you know, they don't usually feel like they're being heard as often. And I think that, um, you know, what's been interesting in this whole discussion, the discussion that I've seen going round and round is that in general, association executives are, are often caught in a place where they have to try to balance internal member expectations and business standards against this, you know, shifting governmental policy. And so it, it almost takes, you know, take they have to step aside from any sort of, you know, personal viewpoints, you know, and they have to look at, at how are they going to guide the ship. You know, and so how how do you do that, John? You've been doing this for a little bit too, you know, <laughs> especially with ASAE. Not to say anything, but you know, it's like I, I think that um, you know, how can an association balance member expectations and business standards against you know uh, changing governmental policy? Well, I think. Uh, as Scott pointed out, a couple of the items, but uh, first of all, uh, we have a very, uh, very clearly defined uh, advocacy and public policy stance. Uh, generally speaking, we are focusing on three, three main areas. Uh, the first area is, is around tax policy. Uh, and uh, we've talked about that already, and we don't need to go back into that unless somebody wants to, but uh, tax <laughs> policy is a huge issue. Uh, the second issue uh, for us, and, and these are not in any order of priority, uh, First Amendment rights to lobby. Uh, mm -hmm. When the Obama administration came on board, uh, they did a lot to try to restrict lobbying. Uh, we met with the White House counsel uh, first year of, of the Obama administration and were able to get them to uh, put on the back burner uh, draft policies that would have drastically restricted lobbying uh, that we think is a First Amendment right. Uh, you know, uh, we may not agree with what one group is lobbying for, another group is lobbying for or against, uh, but we defend uh, anybody's right to lobby. And that's who we are and what we're about. Uh, the third area is around the whole business of meetings and the right of people to uh, assemble and hold meetings in a way that is uh, open to everybody. And that's where we really get into our, our own policies around DNI and discrimination. And we wanna be sure that everyone is welcome. Uh, wherever they're meeting, uh, whatever the venue, whatever the state, whatever the location, uh, we wanna make sure everyone is welcome. And as you know, we've been very uh, vocal and very aggressive uh, in our approach to make sure, uh, or try to make sure, uh, and, and speak against any issue where under the guise of quote unquote religious freedom, uh, people are able to deny public accommodation, uh, in which case we find that to be discriminatory. And uh, we will fight that uh, every time uh, there's something comes up that uh, uh, would warrant it. Kiki, if I could just add to that, you know, John made some relevant points about those big three issues. I think it's important for all of us in the community to recognize that there is a high likelihood that there is an individual 
who knows nothing about our community and nothing about what it is we stand for and the issues we care about. And that's not for any poor reason. It's just, you know, President-elect Donald Trump likely does not have a good working knowledge of the association community. Uh, as a member of this organization, I need, want, and quite frankly, expect ASA to have that conversation with him and his team. Now, it might be expected that perhaps Vice President-elect Pence has heard of ASAE, certainly in the last year of his uh, term as governor. I know he's heard from ASAE. Hopefully he remembers us. Uh, but it's our commitment to make sure that, and it's not just the executive branch, that the Congress knows who we are, what issues matter to us and why, and why we're so focused on those, why we're committed to working with them and any member of uh, the legislature or the executive branch to advance those issues because we think that advances America. And we're willing to work with anybody who wants to advance America and we think associations are a vital part of that. And we will not discriminate and who we can work with to advance those issues that matter to associations and association professionals and those that we they represent. I think, okay, so there is so much that I want. I can't, I knew this hour was going to go by really quickly. We're almost halfway through it. And so I, uh, I'm feeling under the gun a little bit to, okay. but I want, I want to push back a little bit. You knew that I would <laughs> I want to push back a little bit. And, um, you know, president elect Trump has treated women in a less than acceptable way in the past. Uh, women continue to struggle in association leadership. And it, uh, you know, there's been research to show that the more uh, money that an association has, the less likely the CEO or the board will be comprised of women. And in one report, uh, women have gone backward in salaries compared to their, their male counterparts. So what will ASAE do to ensure that women who make up a majority of the workforce continue to achieve leadership roles? And you can't blame me for all these questions. These are, <laughs> these are, these are from some other people too. Well, uh, let, me, let me start and uh, Scott, Scott can chime in uh, with some other views. But uh, first of all, uh, from, a, from a gender perspective, uh, ASAE has been uh, really aggressively now uh, looking at workforce issues. Uh, we recognize that the workforce of 20 years from now, 15 years from now, 10 years from now is going to be very different than the workforce of 20 years ago, 15 years ago, and 10 years ago. And that workforce is going to be much more diverse. It's going to be younger. Uh, I, obviously, it'll be made up of um, men and women uh, in, in equal amounts. And uh, I think that it's going to be important for ASAE as it relates to associations and as it relates to associations as employers uh, to be sure that associations are prepared for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years of workforce development. Uh, mm -hmm. And so uh, we ha our ASE Foundation has a number of projects going on right now that are studying workforce issues, uh, diversity on the board. Uh, we recognize that in many cases women are underrepresented. Uh, I'm happy to say that in ASAE, I think we've done a great job of uh, balancing gender issues uh, as well as uh, other uh, ethnicity and uh, sexual orientation uh, issues. Uh, but I think we can always do a better job. Uh, and as I think it relates to issues around compensation, uh, there are many uh, women who are running large trade and professional societies uh, who are compensated very fairly and equivalent to uh, their male counterparts. That being said, mm -hmm. we also recognize that uh, there are opportunities here for improvement. And uh, through our studying of the issues, and frankly, we hope to, through our career headquarters, association career headquarters, be able to better prepare women uh, to move into the CEO roles because, as we know, uh, virtually 70% of employees and associations now are women, and uh, these are the individuals who are going to be moving up the uh, pipeline and the food chain into the corner office. So uh, we want to make sure that we have a prepared workforce, uh, which uh, needs to be representative of the community at large. Yeah. yeah. And let, me, let me add to that, if I could, Kiki. You know, um, 
two weeks ago, John and I were in Boston with 160 or, or more of ASAE's volunteer leaders. So this would be our three boards of directors, uh, our 29 plus uh, section councils, committees, task force, the chairs and vice chairs of those, um, our DELP scholars, the current class of DELP scholars, as well as members of the senior management team or the executive management team from ASAE. So about 160 plus individuals. This is the 10th anniversary of our leadership retreat. It was an incredible three days together talking about issues that matter to the profession. The thing that struck me, and this is my, I think, eighth consecutive leadership retreat, was just how robust the discussion was. And I think a large part of that was based on who was in the room. And one of the things I think it's important to say is we can do more. We can do more and we're committed to doing more. I think it's important to recognize the work that ASA has helped lead to create an environment where opportunity is available, certainly to women, to other underrepresented populations. But I think as John said, we're committed to threading the needle on what the future can look like. And I've got an ulterior motive. I've got a, my most important job is not as the chair of this board or the CEO of the Ohio Society of CPAs. It says the father of two kids. I've got an eight year old son and a 10 year old daughter. And I want them to have every opportunity that is available to them. And I know that right now there are opportunities that aren't available to them based on gender. And we've got to do more. I'm so proud to be a part of a community that gets that and is working to advance that. Can we do more? Absolutely. I think the commitment that our members need to understand is, ASA is not an organization that rests on its laurels, and it's certainly one that is not going to change its commitment to diversity and inclusion, depending on who lives in the White House for the next four or more years. If anything, we're going to double down on that commitment and, expect, and make sure we're sharing that with everybody. Okay, that is music to my ears, actually, because I, I think that, that that was something that that was what I was looking for personally is, you know, all is well. And I'm proud of ASAE and the work that you've done. We've done to, you know, push on, push forward on diversity and inclusion. And I think that there's been a lot of good work, but I, I see, you know, the, the news and all of the, the disruption that's going on. And I think it's, still not enough, you know, and especially now when there are so many people that, you know, are disturbed by a lot of the, the backlash, I think, that's happened uh, after the election, you know, we're wondering what more do we need to do and, and what does that look like and obviously looking to our leadership for, for that, you know, to say, Yes, you know, so the doubling down on the efforts is, is absolutely music to my ears. There's a conversation happening over here on, on the chat, and um, I hate dragging us back to the discussion about the letter, but let me just, let me just solve this once and for all, okay? Um, many of us experience the headline, manufacturers and associations unite to offer support to Trump. And, and someone referred to it earlier, as a real gut punch when they they read it and I have to say that um, you know that was kind of my reaction too. now now what we've heard over here on the the chat box is people saying well if you actually read the letter that's not exactly what was in the letter it was clickbait you know everything's about headlines so tell me you know was the headline inaccurate um, you know, I'm curious to see what you what you think, John. I'm going to open this up to you, John. And and um, what do you have to say about this? No, oh, thanks a lot, Kiki. I really appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, no, serious, the serious comment is that, uh, yeah, I, I think in hindsight, uh, it was an unfortunate uh, headline. Uh, but having said that, I think a more accurate headline would have been uh, a Trump administration. Uh, because mm -hmm. it's not about the man, it's about the administration. Uh, you know, like it or not, uh, President-elect Trump uh, is going to be our next 45th president. And he is somebody we're going to have to work with. And as I indicated earlier, the, the gist of the letter, uh, whether it was Hillary or, or, or Donald, uh, was really about the power of associations to come together to heal and bring together a divided country. Mm -hmm. That's what, that's really, that, that was the impetus of the letter. It had no other, it was not meant to be partisan. It was not meant to be supportive of an individual, whether it was 
Mrs. Clinton or Mr. Trump. Uh, it was none of those things. Uh, it was all about uh, being able to communicate to a new administration that the National Association of Manufacturers, along with others like ASAE, stand ready uh, to bring and marshal the forces of associations to solve problems. And Lord mm -hmm. knows we have significant problems in this country to solve. Not the least of which is this really continued polarization and feeling of disenfranchisement. Uh, you know, if you if you read into the fine print of the letter, we talk about the fact that, you know, a lot of the people who voted for Mr. Trump are people who feel like their institutions, their government has abandoned them. And, uh, you know, I think we have an obligation and a responsibility to listen to what the people are saying and mm -hmm. work with the administration. Whoever happened to be to win, it was still going to be a divided country to work with the, the administration to bring people together to help to allow associations to do what they do best. And that really is to bring people together, achieve consensus and solve problems. I, you know, you said it right there, solving problems. And so um, I want to kick it back to you, Scott. And you talked about doubling down. I'm, I'm totally zoned in on that. Can you tell? Uh, you talked about doubling down on the commitment to DNI and you know, involving the White House. What is, you know, what do you think about that? John, don't mess, what are you doing with the mic over there? Um. <laughs> well, I must tell you, it's a very unique mic. So uh, I, I, will, I, will, I will leave it alone. Okay. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, Scott, what do you, what do you have, like, what are you thinking as far as, as what that effort might look like? Well, let, let's set the table here. I think it's important for me as the chair of the board of ASA to reiterate, ASA has a firm, unyielding commitment to diversity and inclusion, and it's not just in policy, but it's in practice. Okay? I think that's an important statement to not only make, but to understand. Mm -hmm. And I think as we talk about DNI in our community, it's important to recognize, and, and let me say this as the CEO of a state-based organization. This is not just a DC federal discussion. Quite frankly, we all need to, we all in this community need to understand that many of these discussions are going to happen at the state or local level first, because that is where many would say the laboratory of government really exists. And they're gonna try new things, right? I hesitate to use the word innovate, but innovate because if it can take hold in a state or states or local localities, then it can bubble up and to be looked at um, in, in regions or in, in the nation. So let's stick with the, with, with the DNI issue right now. I mm -hmm. think a number of people are aware that um, earlier this year, ASAE joined a broad coalition and voiced our concern and our opposition to uh, the law that was passed in North Carolina. And many people refer to that as a bathroom bill. I've never been more proud to be a part of this organization uh, than when John articulated why ASA was opposed to that on behalf of our organization. Right. And it was a fallacy to call it a bathroom bill. That bill was really about um, ex uh, taking away um, opportunities that all people have. It wasn't just about uh, using a restroom. And um, we're now looking, as was reported in Associations Now Daily, um, looking at legislation that will soon be introduced, we believe, um, in the state of Texas. Um, that's not to say that's the only state where that will be introduced, but we think Texas is likely to come first. And again, um, the, this bill is, as proposed, would deny citizens accommodations, public accommodations, that all members of our country are allowed to have. Now, mm -hmm. this affects associations specifically because if we're hosting a meeting, or we're having an event and we have members of our organization, volunteers of our organization, staffs of our organization that can have their public accommodations denied just because people don't like or might not believe something they believe, that is wrong. This organization has a practice and a policy that diversity and inclusion matter to us. And as a community where DNI matters, we have a leadership role to play. And we are proud to be able to lead by example. Mm -hmm. I think there's an opportunity for other associations to join us in that. 
I understand that's a difficult conversation to have. Not difficult because it's a difference between right and wrong, but difficult because there are different views and different perspectives within your association as there are within ASA on these topics. Having said that, this matters to our community. This is not only an issue of economics, though this is a, there is a significant economic impact here. This is about affecting our people. Mm -hmm. Kiki, you reference we have a lot of people right now who are hurting, who are confused and don't know what to make of the decisions that have been made in our recent election. I respect that. I think it's important for us as leaders in ASAE to recognize that in addition to respecting it, to do nothing is not an option and to do nothing it, to do nothing is actually taking a direct action. And I want our members to understand that the leaders of this organization, staff and volunteer, understand we've got an important role to play. And that will involve taking difficult stances. We're prepared to do that. I think mm -hmm. what I have learned in the last two weeks is providing the appropriate level of context is critically important. I think if we can do more of that, then we can create bigger opportunities for wins in our community. And I know that's something that John and I and our entire team are committed to doing. Well, you know, I, over here on the side, so it's my job to try to take in all of this information that's coming in and listen to you at the same sure. time. And so there is a massive positive response to what you just said. I think people are hearing that there is this unyielding commitment, as, as Mitchell uh, says here, to DNI, which is excellent. And, you know, but there, there is someone who's, who's asking the question, and I think it was Joan a little bit earlier, um, is inclusion on, does that mean economics too? Is it inclusion on economics too? Because um, that's an important issue regarding diversity and inclusion as well. Um, yeah, sorry, so Scott. I, so I'll just I guess Kiki, so um, if I'm understanding the question correctly, mm -hmm. is, it, is economics a part of that? Yes, ec the economic picture is a part of the DNI um, platform for for us, and certainly is a factor, a lead factor, if you will, in the work we're going to do in Texas, as an example. But I want to be clear: it's not just about money, though. We know money and economics will play a big role for associations. You know, if associations, as we saw uh, with one of our former board members, uh, Rich Epp, and the American Council Association, you know, what they had to do in Tennessee because mm -hmm. of the law that was adopted there, which I'm proud of ASA supporting uh, ACA and Rich and the work they did and also commenting on what was going on in Tennessee. But it's not just pulling out a meeting. We have to understand that the people who will be affected are people on the ground, people who work in the kitchen, people who work um, as wait staff, people who clean rooms, people who work at front desks. Um, those folks are an important part of our ASA community too. And we've got an opportunity and an obligation, we believe, at the board level to make sure we're speaking up and standing up before these laws can get enacted. And that's why we're doing that in Texas as one example. So there's an economic piece here, but there's also a piece that, you know what, um, you've got to lead with character um, and a moral compass. And we know that these issues matter to our people and are at the very heart of what many of our associations were founded to be. And certainly they're a big part of ASA, so we're not going to lose sight of that. But economics is clearly an important role. We can't deny that. And so, Kiki, oh, oh, go ahead. Let me just, let me, let me just elaborate uh, just on, on one point there uh, in terms of our public policy and advocacy uh, and how we make decisions. Uh, mm -hmm. Our DNI committee uh, developed uh, and our board approved in August uh, what we call our uh, advocacy decision tree. Uh, it's a series of uh, steps that ASAE will take every time an issue comes forward uh, to see if this is an issue we will embrace and advocate uh, or whether it's an issue we will support but will support it by signing on or forming a coalition with another group. Uh, so I think we have been very uh, transparent. I think we've been very forthright and have developed uh, a real schematic, if you will, for, uh, the, for having the organization have the ability to make decisions about what are the issues that uh, are issues that ASAE should be taking on head on and what are the issues that ASAE should be supporting uh, from the side and what are the issues that ASAE has no business being involved in.
And so I think that uh, we have that. I'm happy to share that with anybody who wants it. Uh, as I said, it was developed by our DNI committee and approved by the board. And uh, I think it's a real example of how you walk the walk with diversity and inclusion because it really allows us to have a, uh, a methodology uh, for decision making. Well, that is, I think that, I, I don't mean to speak for everyone, but I think that that would be an amazing resource to check out. I'm fascinated by the advocacy decision tree, which sounds like a very, very useful resource for everyone. Um, you know, you touched on, we, we talked about Rich Yep, who has been on association chat before, and, you know, associations now for November, it, it featured a cover story with Rich, and so he is former ASAE board member, past chair of the DNI section council. Um, and so the story uh, regarded the issue of whether or not to hold conferences and events in states that are deemed to have discriminatory policies. What is ASAE's policy pertaining to the selection of meeting locations based on DNI standards and how is that reviewed and enforced? And John, I'm going to send that over your way. Uh, in uh, August, uh, we recognized that uh, with our actions in uh, Indiana, North Carolina, Arkansas, Georgia, Mississippi, uh, the list is fairly long, that uh, ASAE needed to develop a policy uh, mm -hmm. that was proactive about this issue around discrimination and hell holding meetings. And so uh, we crafted a statement, uh, if you will, a policy clause uh, that was approved by the board in August uh, that is now put into our meeting contracts that indicates that uh, if a, a destination, uh, a hotel, a convention center uh, is located in a state in which law a law has been passed that uh, allows for the denial of public accommodation, that that becomes a force majeure and enables the, in this case, ASAE or any association that would use that language uh, to back out of whatever contracts they've signed without penalty. And mm -hmm. so in a going forward way, uh, in every uh, contract that we've put forward now, uh, not in contracts that have been signed previously, but in contracts moving forward, uh, we're putting that language in those contracts. That's, you know, so, um, and I'm, I have to say that, uh, that the conversation over here, there's, there's so much. I, you know, had agreed with uh, your team to find answers to the questions that we didn't get around to asking today. We've got a big job ahead of us. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we're, we're going to get really busy on that. Um, so I wanted... Uh, you know, I wanted to bring up the fact that I'm not the only person who had, you know, made a statement saying that I was concerned about, you know, the direction we were headed because of, you know, um, basically following uh, the decision made at the election. I, uh, there have been other reactions. There have been other things that have come, uh, come from members that is being discussed on Collaborate and elsewhere. And so, Scott, in, in what ways will ASAE staff and leadership be informed by the reactions and collaborate and elsewhere to the letter initiated by members and signed by others? Well, I think, you know, that's a great question. And certainly um, collaborate is one of the avenues we have to, you know, take the pulse, if you will, of where our, where our members are and where, where's, where's, this, where's the sense of the community. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've been, I've been watching, I've been following that. Um, you know, I got my quote unquote ASA start, if you will, um, in the executive management section and was able, had the opportunity to chair that uh, several years ago. So I've been following some of the dialogue there and, mm -hmm. you know, others have shared with me some of the dialogue happening in some of the other places. And I think it's a robust dialogue. The thing that strikes me about that dialogue is um, it represents what you've talked about earlier in this conversation, Kiki. We've got folks on both sides of the aisle here. Uh, we've got different perspectives on what should do, we should do and shouldn't do. I think if I've heard a consistent thread, it's that absolutely it's important for ASAE to be advocating and sharing the power of A, the power of associations, and making sure that that story is known. I think there are folks who have questions, and they're genuine, and they're fair about how we do that and what are the issues we look at. 
I think, you know, certainly John and I have discussed over the last couple of days as we've prepared for our time with you today um, and spoken to members of our public policy committee and members of our team there and our DNI committee. I think there are opportunities to make sure all of that is threading in to inform um, in the future how we go forward. Um, and I think I can say um, unequivocally that's certainly a commitment that we're prepared to make. Uh, we want this organization to be the leader of this community. And what we've seen in the last year is just how much this community is growing in terms of its reach and its influence and its velocity. And there's a lot of excitement and energy in ASA right now. I think there's only more opportunity out there for us to, to seize and create for the people who are part of this community, whether they're members today or not. You know, the reach of the associations now daily is nearly twice um, as much as what our actual membership is. So mm. telling the story has an incredible reach for us. So I think the dialogue that we see in Collaborate, the personal outreach we've, getting, we've gotten from members, and I know John is getting in as well, the phone calls, you know, the opportunities to talk to members at our live events um, or in social media and other way, places, all needs to be a part of the dialogue that informs how we go forward. And how we go forward is with, as I said earlier, an unyielding commitment to diversity and inclusion, not only in policy, but in practice. One of the things I'm most proud of as I lead the organization's board this year is just how committed ASA is to that. You know, the recognition we've received from others is incredible, but it's not about the recognition. When you look at the volunteer leadership retreat as but one example, we had an entire class of Delft scholars who are there participating. But more importantly, we had DELP alumni who are now chairing so many of our committees and councils who've joined our board. Is there opportunity to do more? Absolutely. Is there an opportunity to become more inclusive? Absolutely. Are we committed to doing that? Absolutely. See, that's, and that's, that for me, the, the ASA fangirl inside, you know, like I, I hear that and I think about, you know, I have to say, I heard I heard positive and negative from people after um, after I made my statement, and uh, and it was it's hard because it's like I don't know that I've ever fully appreciated having the membership that I have right now, and mm -hmm. like the power of being a part of something that can impact so many different industries and so many different lives as I do right now. And I think because of that, that responsibility and all of our, each one of our roles in it weighed heavily on me. And I can imagine weighs heavily, you know, on you and your positions. Um, but you know, I think that, that that's, that is the challenge is, boy, I mean, it is, it is hot out there. And <laughs> you know, there's a lot of attention on, you know, these next steps, these next moves, these next months uh, before, you know, a new administration does does take office and begin to institute changes. And so I think that, I mean, there are a ton of questions. I want to ask you one more question before I close things out. Um, and it's, a, it's, it's hard to choose because there's a lot that's out there. Um, but there's a lot of follow-up questions that are coming from the chat box over here on the side. Uh, a lot of people really responded um, with both they were happy about the things that they heard, but they also had more questions about, you know, what would happen if, um, what would happen if, and this, I saw this from John and Sandra. Um, so would ASAE cancel if a state booked passes a law? Um, so, for example, you know, if if Texas passes a law, and we're already booked to be in Texas, you know, ASA conference, what's the story on that? Where where how would you make that decision? Can you say? Uh, well, I think that uh, I I said it earlier. We have a policy. In fact, uh, we uh, do have a, a letter of agreement with Dallas uh, to host our 2021 annual meeting uh, in the letter to Dallas of agreement that they signed is mm -hmm. our clause uh, that stipulates that if Texas were to pass a law that would uh, in any way allow for the denial of public accommodation that we would have every right to not have our meeting in in Dallas. 
Wow. I think that's the, what we'll do. Mm -hmm. What I want our members to know is it's the commitment of our senior leadership, John, his team, our board, to not let that occur to make sure we're advocating with the Texas legislature in this example mm -hmm. and others, we wanna be in Dallas in 2021. Dallas has been an incredible partner for our community and for ASAE. I don't think I can state that clearly enough. Dallas did an incredible job when they hosted our annual meeting before. They've been great partners. They care about our community. They're committed to our community. Dallas rocks, okay? So don't mess with Dallas. <laughs> we're trying to advocate in the legislature to not do this, to not make us have to make this choice because it's bad for Texas, it's bad for associations, it's bad for the people we represent. We wanna come and spend our money. We wanna come and infuse their economy on a small, on, on a four day basis with in the last year, $16 million of on the spot economic advantage and over a 10 year uh, period, an estimated $500 million of return business. That's what ASA annual meeting brings, or at least that's the latest study. We want to be able to do that in Dallas. So I'm proud that ASA isn't just saying, well, here's what we're going to do. You better not do that. We're actually saying, let us come and talk to your legislature to help them understand why this matters to associations. The 1.8 million associations around our country, why this is important to them. So it's not just don't do this. It's here's where we're going to get engaged. So we're not just watching people's back. We're actually out there clearing a path in front of them as well. That's good. I um so everyone, I uh I tell you, I was nervous going into this one, but if you ever want to participate in association chat and had a doubt, I'm glad that you participated in this one. And I have to say that in all my years uh as an ASAE member, um I if I would have guessed that I would have you know, Scott Wiley, John Graham at the same time talking to me about some hard questions and some hard issues, live stream no less, none of this really super controlled. Um, I would have thought that it, I, you were dreaming. Like I, I wouldn't have believed it. And so thank you both for taking a chance on, taking a chance on this technology and on opening yourselves up to questions from me and from our audience today. And, you know, thanks to all of you for joining Association Chat. Uh, the openness to this topic, sharing your time and your insight, extremely valuable. Coming up, we're going to have two great episodes of Association Chat for you. Next week, we're going to hear from JP Murray. He's the CEO of the Murray Company, Leadership Lessons from an Association Pro. This is how you're going to get amped up and ready for your 2017. Uh, and then the week after that, we're going to hear about diversity and inclusion challenges for associations from Sean Boynes, who's the Executive Director at the American Association of Anatomists. And I hope that you've had fun. I hope that you've learned something that will help you now or in the future. And like I said before, we ASAE and Association Chat, we're going to try to respond to all the questions that we're not able to be asked during the live chat in the days following the discussion. I'm not gonna promise it's tomorrow, y'all. I'm gonna say it's coming up. If you like Association Chat, Please consider sharing this chat with your colleagues and give us some love on social media. Follow hashtag A-S-S-N-C-H-A-T on Twitter and Instagram. And as always, if you want to continue the discussion, you can join the Association Chat Facebook group for regular updates on upcoming topics and special guests. See you all again at the same time next week. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, John. Thank you, Kiki. All right. Thanks, everyone.